we have a great panel with us. We've got our moderator, Jen Guarino. Yep, who's the president and CEO of Isaac. Hi, Jen, you can come on in. We have um, Eric Larson, who is CEO of Downtown Detroit Partnership. Hello, Eric. We have Mark Pasco, and he's the Director of Communications at uh, the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, which is uh, getting all the accolades these days for what? The best riverfront? In... Two years in a row. Wow. So, Jen... Take it away. We also have two panelists that are joining us uh, virtually. One is Alexa Bush, uh, who is the program uh, officer for Detroit with Kresge Foundation. And the other is Anke van Hall. She's with us from the Netherlands. And you're going to be hearing both virtual. So this is our first panel where we have virtual and in-person uh, speakers. And Jen, you've got um, a good 55 minutes to have some right. great chats. Yeah. So. Um... Thank you for joining us, and um, Anka and Alexa, hello. Um, so there's a lot to talk about here, and we have the perfect people here to talk about this very big topic. And I'm going to kind of throw out a big question first, which is, given all the socioeconomic, political challenges and divides, how do you even list up this topic as a priority? How do you... How do you, you're the nexus of, you know, uh, private sector, public sector. Eric, how do, you, how do you list this up as a priority in the work that you do amongst all the people that you work with, the organizations you work with? Well, Jen, first, thanks. Um, great to be part of this, uh, you know, this conference. Uh, and, um, and I think it's really fun that Mark and I are actually together on this because, you know, that question, well, and that question really relates very well to what both of us are doing. You know, some quick background in terms of the Downtown Detroit Partnership. We turned 100 this year. Uh, we really are the, the C-suite. The we represent the C-suite leadership within the public, private, and philanthropic sectors. Um, but we do more than that. We really are a convener, a connector, and, and really a, a balanced voice within the broader community, or at least that, you know, that's what we strive to do. And so, you know, it's interesting, that question, because honestly, our job got easier to, during COVID, which is a crazy to think about and crazy to say. But the reality is the importance of public spaces, the importance of the ability to create resilient, sustainable communities that embrace all aspects of our population and our environment uh, became that much more important to the leadership, to the everyday individual, and ultimately to the Detroiters. Um, and so the public spaces, in this case, you know, what we're sort of focused on, um, it became one, something that people valued a, you know, to a greater extent. It was one of the few places that people could come out and feel safe and actually be together um, during the height of the pandemic. But it also reinforced the need for cities to have that kind of respite, that, that green space within a close proximity. Um, some of what we did obviously has changed up the way that we programmed those spaces, um, the way that we responded to some of the health concerns and needs. Um, but again, it, it really actually became easier for us to explain the benefit and the importance of those spaces uh, as we moved through the through the pandemic. So. Thank you. So good segue question for you, Marco. So in, in working together, how do you how do you position this in the community to invite holistically everyone so that you know oftentimes we hear that sustainability is a a privileged proposition instead of one that is shared. Um, how do you make sure that doesn't happen in, in the work that you do? The Detroit Riverfront Conservancy is the perpetual stewards of the riverfront public spaces, and that includes the Riverwalk and that includes the Dequindra Cut. And we're coming up on our 20th anniversary next year, which is really exciting. And we're really proud of the, the legacy we have of community involvement. From the very beginning, even before the organization launched in 2003, we were reaching out to the community 
to ask them questions, share our vision for the riverfront, and kind of ask them what they wanted to see. How would they use these public spaces? What do they want to see? And now when you take a walk along the riverfront, a lot of the great amenities we have, like the carousel and the uh, the, the sandy beach that we have and uh, more food and more restrooms and more activities, those come directly from the feedback we got from the community over the years. So over the years, we've had hundreds of uh, community forums. So you've been speaking with the community for years. Absolutely, because we could have the best riverfront in the world, which we think we do, we have. Um, and But if people weren't coming down there, people weren't enjoying it. If it didn't reflect the needs and wants of the community, then it would be all for naught. So building with instead of for, as they say. Exactly. Pretty good. Um, maybe that's a good time to ask you, Alexa. I mean, you're um, you're you're steeped in community work, right? And uh, now we're segueing into a little bit of um, architecture, landscape. How does the community play a role in um, building sustainability into its everyday life? Absolutely. And again, thanks you all for being, I'm excited to be part of the conversation, trying to be a good global citizen and keeping some germs at home, um, but excited to be here virtually to chat with you about this. Um, you know, I think it's critical, you know, I think, Jen, you raised the good point about, you know, who is sustainability for, I think Olga and Antoine put a point in that too of, you know, uh, you know, design is something for everyone and not just kind of a luxury good or an aesthetic good. Um, but I think of that really broadly of, you know, I think everyone, Detroiters intuitively know how much this matters. It impacts their quality of life in a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they might not use those words to describe it, but I think what we are always trying to do is to make sure that those community wants and needs and priorities um, really come to the forefront in these dis discussions of, you know, how do we invest in the built environment? Um, how do we design places that are truly responsive to those needs? Um, and I think from Kresge, what we think a lot about, so the Kresge Foundation is based in Metro Detroit. We're also coming up on 100 years of the foundation coming up next. Oh, okay. year. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we've got some feedback here and it's difficult to hear. So I'm going to hop okay. over to Anka for a minute. Maybe we can figure out what's going on and we're going to come back to you. Okay. Um, Look, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, so you talk a lot about the factors in success. So, um, you know, how does the math work? How do you make the business case? Can you talk about some of your work and the factors in, in how you can really make this sustainable from a financial standpoint, from a human standpoint? Um, yeah, good morning, good afternoon for uh, uh, Good morning for you all. Um, uh, yeah, my, my, I'm specialized in what we call the third success factor of innovations with high energy ambitions. And uh, that's the human factor uh, that's based on an approach that we, did, that we um, um, developed in the building industry for in general um, enthusiasm for sustainability, sustainability measures. And what we notice the interview, is that we're getting feedback. So we're going to pause here and see if we can technically fix what's going on here. So we'll, oh, we'll return to you in a moment. So, so maybe I'll post the, the question too. So, um, you know, I, I come from a different industry, parallel industry. And what we often hear is, well, you know, it's really expensive to be sustainable. Um, so how do you address that? It has to show up. I think you made you made a point. Uh, you were using the example of food trucks and how you mm -hmm. helped food trucks to be sustainable in the way they delivered food. Can you address just some of the challenges of the cost to be sustainable? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, Jen, it's a great question. One, clearly, this um, hybrid thing isn't sustainable. Um, it's so good to be back in, in in person, and I love seeing those that are here. Um, but you know, I think it's really interesting. I think I think um, sustainability takes so many different forms. Um, one of the organizations that I follow that is over 300 years old is Grosner. It's a English company, uh, you know, based in investment and development, and they do a resiliency report, and it, they do it on world cities around the world, and it really focuses on 
what does you know a city need in order to be resilient? And it's it's climate, it's environment, it's community, it's resource, and, and so it, it's not it's not really about expense. It's not about cost. It's about you know one being deliberate and intentional, and two finding ways to leverage um, you know the the assets and the resources that you have. So food trucks is an interesting example. It's small. But you know, we we run the we're, we believe the country's largest food truck program. It's over 100 food trucks in our repertoire. Um, and we a couple of years ago decided that those food trucks, if they wanted to participate, needed to be sustainable. And so we started to help them consolidate their buying um, so that they had access to products that sometimes are more costly, but did it at bulk um, to try and remove that barrier of of, of, of access. Um, but most importantly, we provided the re the receptacles, we provided the space, and we provided the sort of guidelines uh, that took it away from a small business having to create that, having to figure that out when they're trying to just get the food prepped and the truck on the road, and really gave them an option to, to participate in this program with that already in place. So that's a small example, but every everything that we are doing, we believe has some level of building on that the city's resiliency or building on that sustainability, whether it's the way that we design these public spaces um, and the fact that we're constantly thinking about things like you know, water retention and runoff. We're constantly thinking about the you know, grow season, but then it's also the social aspects. I mean, how do you make sure that there's inclusive act, act, you know, access? Uh, programming is inclusive and free. We do over 2000 uh, um, programs in our public spaces a year and 90% of those are free and, and fully accessible uh, to anyone in the public. So it's that kind of stuff that I think ultimately creates not only sustainability, but health. So it's really um, relieving the burden on small business maybe to mm -hmm. solve those things by themselves or, or at least make them, uh, help them to be sustainable in their practice and also removing the barriers to access to all the programming that you're gonna offer. Definitely. Um, maybe we should circle back and see if we've got the technical glitches uh, fixed here. Arvind, can we circle back to you and talk about um, the factors of success? Yeah, do you hear me better now? Is it? I think you might be muted. No, I'm not muted. No. no? Okay, we'll circle back here then. Um, so, so, Marco, can we talk about um, Let's go back to this this programming topic. Yeah. You know, how important is programming? Programming is it like just like sustainability? It's a big word. What does programming mean to you? And how does programming really play a role in resiliency and in economic equity? How does it play a role? Yeah, programming. That's a great question. Programming is a big word, and it's a popular word. It's a buzzword. You hear it thrown about quite a bit. And to us, to the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. Programming, the way that we handle programming, um, we consider programming the 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 um, programs we put forth for the community to enjoy. We like to use the the body, mind, soul aspect of, of what we do. We have programs that are, we have a senior walking program. We have moonlight yoga and tai chi classes. We have a program to help children learn the joys of reading. And we also have fun programming activities to do as well. So the way we look at programming and what we offer is we want to have something for, for everyone because again, you can have a great public space, but if the public space is not activated, if it does not have reflect the needs of what the community wants, you know, what are you doing it for? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So in terms of, of equity and, and inclusiveness, everything that we do reflects the needs and the wants of the community. Thank you. Um, so Eric, you talked a little bit about um, looking to other examples, you know, just studying from, from other examples. Um, Margaret, can, can you talk about any, were there any sort of beacons of, of um, inspiration that you look to on a regular basis or turn to when maybe you got stuck or maybe just needed a, a shot of inspiration? Were there beacons of inspiration for you around the world? Are there any examples you can give us of things that you look to? There's a lot of great organizations throughout the city right here. And uh, Eric's organization 
is, is one of them. I mean, they're an inspiration to us, taking a look at what they've done in the public spaces, spaces that they manage and how they manage and how they activate them and how the community has embraced them. That's a great opportunity as well. I mean, Detroit is very blessed to have some wonderful public spaces. There's the, the Campus Marshes Park and, and the Riverfront and Belle Isle and Eastern Market. These are all great public spaces and all great cities have great public spaces where people can gather together. So we're very fortunate to have a lot of inspiration just throughout the community here. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, especially early on in the, the organization's history of conservancy, we had field trips where we would go out and we would visit great public spaces throughout the country. Cincinnati and, you know, we went to Toronto and Cleveland and all these other great cities, Chicago, down in Texas to see their public spaces, to learn best practices and just see how the community engages with those public spaces as well. And most recently, before we started our Ralph, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Centennial Park transformation of the West Riverfront, we put together a community activation team made up of 21 people throughout our community who could serve as ambassadors out there in the community about this project that we're working on. And we kind of knighted them to go out into the community and kind of spread the gospel of, of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But we also had them take some field trips with us. So we went to three great cities. We went to Philadelphia and to um, Chicago and to New York just to see those public spaces, talk to those people who made these public spaces happen so we could take those, you know, the good feelings and the good information and come back and apply that to our public spaces as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I mean, you know, Mark is very kind. We we both look at each other's organizations um, and, you know, try and graft off best practices, but also share uh, successes and ideas as well as failures. So there, you know, that's that's one of the neat things about Detroit's DNA. The, um, you know, in general, this is a community that really embraces each other, mm -hmm. that wants everybody to succeed. During the pandemic, uh, actually slightly before the pandemic, um, you know, there was a push, and this was really led uh, in large part by Laura Trudeau and, and others uh, to bring this parks coalition together, which takes some of the greatest neighborhood parks and brings them into uh, a collective uh, so that we can share best practices and, and really think about how we can support each other, whether it's supporting each other in terms of the ability to raise funds or the ability to redesign. And the cities at that table, as is obviously all of the neighborhoods throughout uh, the, the city, um, which is, I think, very important. We also do tend to look at other cities, other examples, other great public spaces. We're right now working on a potential to build, you know, to continue to break down some of this barriers around the city that the highway system created. So you look at places like Clyde Warren and Dallas and what did they do right there, but how do we make sure that those public spaces and the public spaces ultimately we are responsible for stewarding, which are public assets, um, still represent Detroit, that they're authentic Detroit. I mean, it's wonderful to go look at these other cities and look what they've done, but ultimately we can't lose our own identity and our own DNA. I think that's such an important point. And I, um, you know, I, I don't um, hail from Detroit originally. I've been here for 10 years and I've just been watching this remarkable transformation just from what I saw in Detroit when I first arrived to now. And one of the things that is, is is really beautiful to see is that when you are in Campus Marshes in the summer and you're sitting out, it it feels like Detroit. Yeah. When you're at Eastern Market, it feels like Detroit. So um, it's easy to begin to take those things for granted as if they just appeared and they happen just because we're lucky. So um, maybe this is a good time to talk about, um, if we can bring back in Alexa maybe, is how do you ensure for the long term yep. that this momentum continues mm -hmm. and we don't lose this and begin to take it for granted instead of rather than you know making it part of our ongoing DNA. So Alexa, maybe we can bring you back in on that very topic. Or maybe uh -oh. not. Uh oh. You can hear us, but we can't hear you. I'm so sorry about the technology. Sorry, guys. Well, but but keep the yeah, but it's interesting because I mean you know Kresge is a, is absolutely one of the best examples we have in the city of a foundation that is committed to not only public space but also public service and so and it's not just obviously Detroit they're not they're they're impactful in the region 
which is critical to the success of Detroit, but they're also impactful around the world. Um, and so one of the things that I think is so unique, and I really wish Alexa could talk about this is it's talk on behalf of Alexa. No, but seriously, <laughs> but, but we have an amazing foundation community. Yes. Um, and Kresge has been at the forefront of leading a lot of those yes. you know, foundation voices. And the program content that they not only create, but the program content that they have access to is is beyond anything that we as individuals would have without them. And so yeah. having partners like that um, is absolutely critical, but it also is a good um, gut check every once in a while because these foundations don't let us get away with sort of just doing, you know, what we, uh, you know, sort of feel is, is bad in our best interest. They really are focused on the greater good and keep us, you know, in many ways, so honest. Said mm -hmm. Yeah, to see exactly. You, right. Yeah, honest. It is so important to have the foundation community come, um, come to support these kind of things because it's, it's hard to, not everybody can see a vision. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and so to ask for support when it's just an idea, it's a PowerPoint, it's an, an architect's rendition, you know, uh, to, to have organizations like that say, yeah, I can see it. I can see how that would how that would matter. Let's talk about, Marco, how um, let's continue this conversation a little bit more. How do you how does this become a part of the famous Detroit pride? We all know what Detroit pride feels like, right? It's a very prideful city. How do you, how does this become part of our makeup, and how does the you know future generations how do they take this forward? How do you make sure that happens? I think the way that we can all make make sure that that continues this momentum continues. I mean, when you go back, even if you look at the last five years ago, Detroit is a much different place in terms of the businesses and, and more people are moving here. The public spaces are evolving. There's more public spaces. I think the way that we can keep that momentum going is just keep doing what we're doing. Can manage the public spaces that we have well, um, continue to grow those public spaces in a way that is sustainable and you know natural and, and organic. And you know, not to make light of it, but almost at the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, we don't want to get too big for our britches, so to speak. You know, our vision 20 years ago was five and a half miles of revitalized riverfront from bridge to bridge, from the bridge to Canada to the bridge to, to Belle Isle. You know, that that is our mission. You know, some people are saying, why not go bridge to bridge to bridge? And who knows? Maybe that happens someday. But for right now, we want to concentrate on our original vision, five and a half miles. So we want to continue managing that space, growing it in a way that makes sense, in a way that is sustainable. So it's so exciting, um, the, the, the public spaces and just the momentum that we have happening in Detroit. And to go back to a previous point that Eric was making, the Kresge Foundation, the Kresge Foundation was one of our launching partners. We launched in 2003 with the city of Detroit, Kresge Foundation, and uh, General Motors. And Detroit, a lot of people know this, but some people don't. Detroit is an incredibly generous community. We have the Kresge Foundation, the Wilson Foundation, Davidson Foundation, the Community Foundation. We have all these great foundations. And there's also a lot of great corporate citizenship as well throughout the community as well. So all those public-private entities working together with that vision of, you know, a one Detroit with all these organizations leading the charge in their their, you know, their re respective um, goals is just an incredible thing. Thank you. Can, I just, can you guys hear me? Can, try, can, try to, can, there, can, can you hear me this time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Alexa can speak on behalf of Krusty herself. So <laughs> I'll bet you are dying to chime in here. So I'm not even going to ask you a question. Just chime in. Sure. Um, and thanks to everyone so far who's spoken so kindly of some of our work. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, I think the work that's happening downtown, the work that's happening on the Riverfront Conservancy are so transformational in the city. And I think the Kresge Foundation has tried to support a lot of those big catalytic projects um, that not only support Detroit, but really become destinations for how we think about our region. On the other end of that spectrum, though, we think a lot about, you know, what are the everyday spaces for Detroiters that might be closer to home and in their neighborhoods. Um, so we also think a lot about, you know, the neighborhood park, the walk to school, the schoolyard, um, 
you know, they may seem a little bit, you know, you're not pulling from the metro region to come to the neighborhood park, but I think they play a really key role, even um, Jen in your early comment about how do we make the case for these places. Um, I think they really connect to quality of life for residents. I really think they relate to how we retain Detroiters, how we may attract new people. Um, that making sure that that same quality of design, that there's programming that encourages belonging, that supports social cohesion, um, you know, getting to meet your neighbors. We, we care a lot about that level of interaction as well as what happens in some of our regional spaces. Um, you know, in addition to some of the big grants we've made into big projects like the Riverwalk, we also have programs like um, one that we call KIPP D Plus or Kresge Innovative Programs Detroit, where we have an open call to residents across the city to um, fund projects, oftentimes that are taking place in those community and neighborhood public spaces. They might be converting a vacant lot into a pocket park or a place for children or families to gather. Um, a lot of times they relate to programming. And what we're trying to do as well is in addition to, you know, thinking about how do we how do we participate as a partner and a steward in these spaces. Um, with the KIPD program also are moving toward a grant making process that actually brings residents into it through the selection and advisory committee. So we think a lot too about not only making sure Detroiters receive you know, the benefits and the ability and in this world of scarcity we've been talking about, um, some of those small resources to activate their space, but also to think, you know, how do we truly partner with community in a different way as a foundation and actually try and share share resources and share the decision-making as well. Um, so yeah, for us, it really comes down to elevating that community vision. And ultimately, you know, I think programming is so important, but as is supporting and uplifting the culture of a place, you know, is this the route kids walk to school? Is this where a birthday party happens? Um, how do we tap into that day-to-day -day life? I think it's ultimately the marker of success and sustainability for a lot of these places. May I add something? Please, please. Yeah. But, um, Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. No, because it's it's uh, what Alexa's talking about is exactly what what what's what we're trying to do in the Netherlands uh, in a big program that's that that's inspired actually by the SNAP approach in Toronto. And that and we take um, the we have a big energy transition in the Netherlands. All um, neighborhoods have to get rid of natural gas because for not only for sustainable reasons, also because of the earthquakes in the northern part of the Netherlands because of the natural gas winning. But um, that's a huge program, but it's very much focused on technology. And what we try to do in this program with 18 um, municipalities in 18 neighborhoods to use that energy transition exactly for the things that Alexa is talking about, to create, improve the neighborhood, make it a better neighborhood, make it a nice neighborhood, improve the public spaces. So not only the houses create uh, jobs for people, uh, let them uh, get to know each other. So that's, that's really, um, I think the same kind of thinking, but then closely related with our big energy transition program in the Netherlands because of our of all the, the, the Paris climate uh, um, goals, but also our problems with the uh, natural gas winning. So this strikes me as um, very different from the way we looked at public spaces in the past in that it seems um, the design process involves a lot of future thinking. Mm -hmm. So and sustainability in its in its in the definition of it is future thinking. Yeah. It is resilience, it is long term. So, you know, you all have been working in these areas for, for a good amount of time. Maybe, um, Anka, what do you think is different this time around? How, how is the way we're approaching um, activating public space um, to ensure inclusivity, um, economic um, strength and mobility? How, how is it different this time around? Why should we believe this way is the way that's going to work? I, I think because we're living in a very complex world and everybody everything is everything is connected all problems this is kind of a biodiversity climate change uh, poverty uh, loneliness it's, it's so much going on and we were used to focus uh, to to focus on each problem by a different group of people not connecting and what i 
what I see happening now is that people try to create win-win situations and try to work together um, and, and uh, try to handle this complex situation um, from different point of views instead of, and, and not with those silos anymore. That's, that's, and I'm, it's not the real future yet, I think, but I see a lot of movement towards that, that direction. Thank you, thank you. And, and I'm gonna just go ahead and guess, Alexa, you might be um, the youngest of, uh, of us here. So, um, but what, what, why did you get into this? What inspires you? Why, why do you believe this is gonna work? Why do you, why have you spent so much of your young career in this and what, what inspires you? Why are you optimistic? Yeah, um, no, thanks for the question. So my my mom is a Detroiter. I have families who are here. And I think for me, thinking about, you know, even that family history of, you know, my great grandfather who moved to Detroit from Alabama and sort of what Detroit offered in terms of economic opportunity and mobility. Um, I've just been really fascinated about, you know, how does the city sort of regain that ability to be such an engine for people into a future that I think attracts people to the city. And I think is so much of kind of the grit and the spirit that attracts people so much to the culture of Detroit. Um, you know, for me, it has to do with, again, rebuilding some of those social connections that I think really frayed, you know, in the first panel, I loved where we landed with like schools and, you know, a really walkable city, because I do think those are things that um, you know, for the benefits that we've gained for Detroit's role as kind of the center of the Motor City, um, I think we haven't always taken into account the downsides of that, which really is the sense of, you know, how we've become isolated or disconnected from one another. I really see public space as a venue to rebuild some of that social connection. You know, I think Eric spoke really eloquently toward, you know, his job becoming easier in the pandemic because people when they were so forced to be at home, um, recognize not only for their own physical health, but mental health, how important it is to have these places, how important it is to still gather in safe ways, even in, in the crisis, in the moment of a pandemic, um, that I just have a lot of faith that, you know, the, the talent is here in Detroit and it's really unlocking that and understanding how do we activate it. Um, you know, I think our innovation has come from a place of scarcity. I joined I used to work in the in the planning department in the city before joining the Kresge Foundation um, and really think to Detroit having gone through the process of a municipal bankruptcy kind of allowed people to imagine something different than the status quo, right? And I think, you know, the downside of humans is sometimes we have to hit the bottom before we can get, get aligned to make that change. Um, but I think, you know, in the business community, in residents, you know, across the board, I think I'm excited in Detroit at the opportunity to rethink those systems um, because of the difficult past we've been through and the knowledge that, you know, what's in the status quo isn't what we need. And we really need to look to that future to create a more resilient and place of opportunity in the city. So this, this idea of connectivity is just such a key part of this, right? And and uh, I, I might get this number wrong because I've heard the number change several times. What are we, 132 square miles or something like that? Something we're, like we're, that. we're a yeah. gigantic, gigantic mm -hmm. city that has been um, become a patchwork. So to reconnect those patchworks becomes uh, real challenging when you yep. have a not near the population that used to fill that patchwork. So it is part of what we're talking about reintroducing connectivity to people? Absolutely. So I mean, does it feel like to be connected again? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, you know, you asked uh, them what, you know, what gets them excited. I, I personally have never had as much excitement or energy around this aspect of our work uh, as I do now, because while it's a challenge to have the patchwork, it's also an opportunity. And so things like the Joe Lewis Greenways um, is another great example of us and the leadership that we currently have. Explain that for those that may not be familiar with that work. So Joe Lewis Greenway, which actually links up to the regional greenway system is, is already uh, in place. It's actually teeing off of the mm -hmm. DeWinder Cut. So mm -hmm. Mark, I don't know if you want to talk about how successful the DeWinder Cut has been as an example of that, but then. Yeah, yeah the, the DeWinder Cut, for those of you who may not have heard about it, the DeWinder Cut is a two mile greenway that connects Easter Market with the riverfront. It used to be a railway. 
And at Mac Avenue and at Atwater, it's at street level, but then it quickly goes below grade because it was a, a railway and it's a two mile stretch. And uh, that will connect with the Joe Louis Greenway. And the Joe Louis Greenway is a 27.5 mile greenway that the city of Detroit is working on around the entire city. And that ties into a regional greenway system, it ties into Quinter Cut, and also ties into the riverfront. And a new greenway that we're working on, we're really excited about the Southwest Greenway, which, which is going to pick up right behind the train station that Ford is working on and connect it to the riverfront. So now the community, Southwest Detroit, Mexican Town, Hubbard Farms, all of those uh, people who live in those great, very vibrant communities who never had easy, convenient, safe access to the riverfront are now going to have access to the riverfront. We're putting the finishing touches on that and hoping to uh, to open that as, as soon. So, so that connectivity, not only to the riverfront, but to other great public spaces like, like um, you know, Eastern Market and Campus Marshes Park and Beacon Park and things like that is incredibly, incredibly important. That is going to help the city grow. And not only is it great for the people who live here, but I think it's going to help attract more people to the city as well, because they're going to have that connectivity. They're going to have that connectivity to be able to get to work or get to the coffee shop or get to, you know, fresh produce and food and things like that. And I think, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, please. I was just going to say, so, you know, and I, I think it was really helpful for Mark because they're, you know, at the front of that planning for the Joe Lewis. But, you know, it's it's also, it's not just about the physical connections. It's also about the, the leadership commitments mm -hmm. that have been made. The mayor has signed on to the 10-minute walk city uh, initiative, you know, which is international. Um, the planning department, you know, we heard obviously from Antoine earlier, but, you know, the planning department uh, now through two leadership has been committed to making sure that you know, there is public space, green space, you know, within a walkable uh, part of every uh, every resident throughout the city. Um, we did a mapping that, you know, we're actually right now uh, talking with the Community Foundation about making an open source um, uh, product, which helps ha allow data to drive some of these decisions as well. So we mapped over 3,000 data points. Um, first, you know, mapping every green space, whether it's a small little, you know, dot on a map or something as big as the riverfront um, throughout the city. We then looked at, you know, within rings, where what's the population? What's the population criteria around that? What do the, the demographics look like? Where is there higher degrees of health issues? Um, asthma is a big one in terms of air pollution. You know, I think about the, the, the energy transfer study that, you know, was forwarded to us. That was about not only the uh, the energy issues that you know the Netherlands are having, but also health issues. Um, so I think all of that is getting packaged in ways that we can be again much more deliberate, much more intentional, and also be able to make the case both financial as well as social um, to drive a lot of these decisions, which is very exciting. So that linkage I think is equally as important as the physical linkage. Yes. So as humans, you know we. We have uh, a sense when things are getting better. We 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 know this this feels right. This feels like it's in the right direction. And so a lot of what we're talking about just it just feels right. It makes sense. It's a it's a human need we have. And at the same time, funders, journalists, are, what's the data? What's the data? Prove to me this is working for us. Prove to me this is you know uh, economically good for everyone. Um, how do we what, what what do you look at as milestones as data points to say, you know, there's these success factors that we have to make sure we're circling back to just say, yes, in fact, this is affirming what we believe is humans, that this feels right, this looks and feels right, this is a real deal. Anka, maybe you could talk to maybe how can we look at that? What are, what are the milestones that we want to not lose sight of? Um, yeah, that's hard to say because the when, when I'm talking about energy transition, the traditional lot is change. It, it, it takes a while before you see the great results. So I think that it's it's very important to to celebrate every small small step and the things that are working because success is 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 kind of a glue that that attracts all kind of people, also residents. And so I'm I'm very much in favor of having parties as much as possible about everything we. We reach because sometimes what looks like a small step 
can can be uh, what we call small win. One sm at the end, it can be uh, can have a huge impact. And being aware of those small results is, I think, the way to 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 bring us uh, forwards in these complex times. So I think um, that that's so it's hard to say what are the real stepping stones because it's 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 like normally we look like this if we want want to get somewhere, but in a transition. There's a long time that you don't see that the soil is getting better and better, but, but certainly the flowers start to grow. But we're still in that time when you don't see much, but a lot of things are going on, the, on underneath. And keep being aware of those little successes. People, we are becoming more happy, more feel more safe, or new um, new new public spaces. You should really celebrate the things to 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 make the ball running uh, rolling so I think. being mindful and acknowledging those incremental progressively good exactly. changes exactly. over time alexa do you have any thoughts on that yeah i mean it's such an important question and i always think of it with two minds because i do think you know being data driven and going back to that is really important to to consider things that have been missed in the past you know to center equity and make sure that you're actually able to lift up people who've maybe been at the margins or maybe intentionally excluded but I often wonder, you know, whether it's elected, whether it's residents as well, that, you know, I think some people are swayed by data and other people are definitely more swayed by belief, right? And it's it's also the storytelling and the narrative. Um, that's why I really like what Anka was raising about, you know, celebrating these small wins, because I actually think for a lot of people, that's how they relate to the change or understand what it might mean for them uh, really through that embodied experience. Um, I know in a number of our projects in neighborhoods, you know, we've, we've worked with groups like Detroit Collaborative Design Center, um, a lot of designers and have actually come around to the idea that some of these small wins, some of these testing of ideas, right? So before you build a park, before you do a road diet, before you do a big project, um, how might you test that at scale in a small way and actually allow people to see the physical transformation? Um, sometimes I think those opportunities, especially, so I'm, I'm trained as a landscape architect, and I think for me, it's really easy to imagine an alternate future. The more that we can actually explicitly give people who might not have that training the window in, um, and I, I do love Anka's point about the celebrating wins as a way to change the narrative that I do think we need to do our data, but I also think we really need to think about narrative and storytelling and experience um, to bring people on board to the change that I think we want to see for a more sustainable future. Well, I, I absolutely uh, commend both of those thoughts because it, it's not everything is data driven. And uh, I do think celebrating, I, I can't even call them small wins. Um, I mean, I look at what the Design Corps has done with the month of design and what that's done in the month of September here, yeah. an extraordinary, yeah. you know, Easter market after dark. I mean, that five years ago, what was happening that's there, right. you know? So it, it is really important. Sometimes that's, maybe that's a good reminder that yes, data matters, but but we all know when something is 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 shifting and, and, and to have some faith and belief in, in that matters. And of course that matters when we're talking to partners because yep. we have to hold hands mm -hmm. in, in this path together, uh, certainly. Um, any other thoughts you'd like to add, Marco? Re regarding the the data, I mean, getting data together, I, the, I think it's relatively easy. I mean, we can take a look at one of the events we have on the riverfront and we can tell how many people came. And we have a good feel for how many people visit the riverfront each year. It's like 3 million people a year visit the riverfront. That That's great. And that data is important and it helps reinforce the mission. But what really resonates with us and what really makes us happy and proud is the, the experiential opportunities that people have along the riverfront and other public spaces, because that's, you can't, you can't necessarily put your finger on it like a number you can, mm -hmm. but it's that, that quality of life that sustainable public places can bring to a community that is very important. Mm -hmm. And and you know helps a community like Detroit to continue to evolve, and you know on the incredible path that it's on now, of of you know being a city we can all be proud of. Yeah, I mean, I I, I you know while I think data informs a lot of decisions, especially you know within some of the funding uh, community and so forth, 
uh, the emotion, um, uh, you know, and and just the the individual reaction uh, to whatever it happens to be, and and it ha doesn't have to be a you know a significant uh, intervention activity program event. Um, you know, I think about you know the the impact that our social worker that we have embedded on the streets now seven days a week as part of our ambassador program, and the fact that she has already touched over 325 individuals that are dealing with some systemic issue, whether it's mental health or homelessness. Um, and then what are the services that we need to provide in those public spaces, not just in the downtown, but throughout the city. But, you know, for instance, during the pandemic, we, we you know, uh, put out a series, which now have continued, of uh, hand washing stations and hygiene hygiene st stations. Um, every new uh, permanent installation that we're putting in these public states will have those public facilities um, built in because it is a part of the, the community that has to that we have to have um, you know service and and have access to. So it's those kinds of things that yes, there's data behind some of that, but it's as much about. You know, it's just the quality of of experience, the quality of life, and the you know the joy that it brings. Thank you. In, in the beginning, you maybe I'm, in the beginning you asked me about the third success factor, and that's yeah. exactly what's related to that because technology is important, important money is important, of course, the financial things, but the 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 human response, the human behavior is 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 also extremely important and it sounds so logical to, to have an eye to keep an eye on that but in practice it's often forgotten and and that's what we try to 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 do and there's a lot of research has been done um to help us uh, uh, yeah, using that 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 human factor in a way that create more enthusiasm for sustainability uh, challenges but also uh, and, and and that has a lot to do with the small things in in daily life that are in the mind of most people and like uh, safe public spaces uh, nice places to meet and, and things like that mm -hmm. thank you perhaps now's a good time to open up for a few questions sure, sure. um take questions from the audience Okay. okay, when you're talking about return on investment, how do you value the social return on investment? I know you guys kind of spoke to that indirectly, um, but as we know, what gets measured gets managed. Um, so how are you creating, I guess, um, how are you how are you creating a currency? That? You want to go first or yeah? That's a really, really great question. And, you know, again, uh, the d donations we receive, the you know, financial re report received, that's, that, that's easy to take a look at the numbers. But the, the intangible part of it is, you know, how are you, how are you making a difference in, in people's lives? And um, I think that the proof in the pudding, so to speak, is when you look at the numbers of people coming down to to the riverfronts, and you see the the enjoyment in people's faces, and you see people from all walks of white life visiting the riverfronts. Um, to us, that is kind of our that is how we judge the the return on investment, if you will. So I mean, we you know we we track very closely the the demographics of. Uh, the population that is utilizing our public spaces, and we adjust to make sure that there is a truly equitable representation of the population um, very deliberately. So we really are thinking about our programming, uh, as well as the design of these public spaces, uh, the ability to access those public spaces. We also are working very closely, obviously, with all of our public sector partners. Uh, the Detroit Par Police Department is a perfect example where it's much better for us to deal with somebody's individual issue than it is to arrest them and take them you know, to, to jail. So we're constantly working with the downtown services group officers to work with, like, for instance, our embedded social workers, as well as, you know, our own park staff to really understand what the individual's needs are, the actual person's needs are, 
um, and then try and address that. So that's that to me is not only social currency, it is actually bankable currency mm -hmm. that we can, because you know, we can't have a system that is just taking people off the street. It, it, it's not a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't get at the heart of it, so for us, that's how we're measuring in, 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 in that particular example. Um, the other is obviously access, like I mentioned, to sort of typical hygiene needs. Um, you know, it's not appropriate to have a restroom that is locked. I mean, what good does that do except for those that have the key? So all of those kinds of things I think are the current that ultimately makes for long-term sustainable, you know, investments in public space. And if I could jump in there too, um, an initiative that we've supported both in Detroit, but as well as cities like Memphis, Philadelphia, Akron, and another, and a few others, is something called Reimagining the Civic Commons um, that has developed a set of measurement tools that try to get at some of the qualitative that I think you're after, um, where we've tracked things like and again, this isn't something you can measure in the census. It's required us to build some infrastructure to go door to door. Um, but we've talked to people about how has trust changed in the neighborhood, both interpersonally between neighbors, between people and institutions, between people and local government. We've asked people um, how often they've interacted with neighbors in a public space. We've asked people how often they've met a new friend or stranger in a public space. Um, that there are some ways, I think, to still put that into the data world. Um, and we've been working really hard on a number of those metrics. All of that's available at civiccommons.us if you're interested, um, but tried to come up with some really easy ways to, you know, in our case, train residents to go out and collect this data. So it's very accessible um, and pretty low technology to do it, but it's given us a way, you know, it's not exactly like A to B, it's a little more complicated, but to say in an environment where we're reinvesting in the public realm, how is that impacting trust? How is that impacting interaction? How is that impacting cohesion? Um, that I would just share that as a resource that is free and available to practitioners working in the space. Thank you. We have, a, we have another question here. Um, is the Detroit Riverfront Greenway intended for the broader metro community as well as Detroit residents? Hmm. The short answer to that question is is absolutely. Now, speaking of data, we did a survey not that long ago where we uh, asked a, a bunch of people who were visiting the riverfronts um, where they came from. And it was really interesting to see that it was pretty evenly split. There were roughly 40% of people from uh, throughout Southeast Michigan were using the riverfronts and roughly 40% of people who actually lived in the city of Detroit were regular users of the riverfront as well. And the extra 20% or so came from people, you know, outstate Michigan or other places or things like that. So, so absolutely everything that we do is, is for the residents of Detroit to use and enjoy as well as, you know, visitors and people from throughout the community as well and that's one of the reasons we're really really proud of not only do we have the riverfront but building those connectivities into the community like the dequinder cut does and like the new southwest greenway will do giving people access to these public spaces thank you um and we have one more question here Hello, good morning. Um, so my name is Tanya Stevens. I am a native Detroiter. I am a designer as well by trade. Um, my question, I mean, well, more than anything, I, I attend these events because I'm always curious to hear sort of who's in the room and also what's being discussed. Um, and so uh, my initial question, um, and you just spoke to that um, in terms of the specific demographics of who's actually patronizing these spaces. Um, you know, as we know, a lot of people are still very hesitant you know, to travel down or to, you know, go downtown. And so um, how do you guys, you know, sort of intentionally try to, uh, you know, what's your outreach strategy for residents in the communities and the neighborhoods that are still very, you know, hesitant about going downtown? Yeah, I mean, it's a, tell you, it's a great question. And, you know, it's something that, you know, we obviously don't have it perfect. And I think that's one of the vulnerabilities that we need to be continuing to express. Uh, as we do our work, but we we work very closely with all of our partners throughout um, you know the city. Um, you know we are working with many of the neighborhood 
groups, you know, the Downtown Detroit Partnership has a benefit because not only is MoGo a part of our repertoire, which is in all of you know the the neighborhoods, but also now expanded into other counties. Uh, that is a connectivity to what those needs are. Um, but we also have the Ambassador Program, and we're providing clean and safe services on a contract basis to many of those neighborhoods, including places like Live Six and so forth. And so we're constantly trying to, to, to understand that. I think this is another great uh, example where, you know, our partners at Kresge and other foundations um, help lift up uh, those voices and those needs as well. Um, and then last, I mean, for again, for us at the Downtown Detroit Partnership, um, we spend a lot of time not only on the on the on the the residents sort of needs the Detroit residents needs, uh, but also the small businesses um, and how can we make sure that the small businesses not just in the downtown but the small businesses throughout the the city have representation. So, for instance, our market program pulls from throughout the city. It's not we just launched the Spirit Card, which is a a uh, you know a, an online credit card that is only available for to for businesses located, small businesses located within the city to participate in. So we have those kinds of things that are trying to lift up the voices um, that you're talking about. But again, we aren't perfect. We're still working on it and we'll take any and, and all ideas. Thank you, Tanya. So we want to thank you very much for this time. It's a very vibrant, good conversation. Thank you for all the hard work uh, that you all are doing. And I'm personally very inspired by all the work you do. And uh, it's going to be Fun to see this continue to unfold. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great, great.